The main goal of ecology is really to figure out how nature works, how these natural ecosystems function, from complex interactions among species to broad-scale mechanistic explanations for, for how diversity is distributed through entire ecosystems, from how these ecosystems recover after disturbance to how they cycle nutrients and store carbon. By understanding these questions, we begin to, to have the tools to formulate intelligent solutions for global environmental problems. My research group addresses these kinds of questions by testing basic theory in ecology. Over the next 10 minutes, I hope to be able to convince you that, that basic research is fundamentally important. And it's not just important for ecology and solving environmental problems. It's not just important for scientists and scholars, but it's important for all of society. It's important for everyone in the audience. <clears throat> In my lab, nearly all of our research is done in tropical forests. And this work has taken us to places around the world, like this forest in Southeast Asia, the Amazon Basin, Guiana Shield, and Central America, where we currently do most of our work. Tropical forests are one of the most important ecosystems in the world, and this is why we study them. They contain more than half of the species on the planet, and they're also incredibly important in terms of carbon storage. More than any other ecosystem, the vegetation in tropical forests contain huge amounts of carbon. And they get that carbon from the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is floating around the atmosphere, and it gets pulled into plants and incorporated into the plant tissue, where it can stay there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we know CO2 is a very important greenhouse gas. So the more that's being pulled out of the atmosphere, the better we are as a planet. So most of the carbon that we find in ecosystems are in trees, really big trees. And tropical forests have a lot of really big trees. In addition to trees, we have other growth forms that are also important in terms of diversity and carbon dynamics. For example, these woody vines, really, really abundant, super diverse in tropical forests. Um, but they also affect carbon storage in a, in a fairly unpredictable way. So over the years, we've made some interesting discoveries. We've published papers on basic ecology and how different mechanisms seem to work. And I would like to think that, that our work has helped make incremental advances in the field of ecology. About a decade ago, something interesting began to happen. As, as my research group and other groups were, were testing basic theories in these ecosystems, we started to notice that the forests were actually changing. And as we were collecting longer data sets, longer term data sets, we started to realize that the data were becoming very clear. We're getting an increase in these woody vines, and the trees are beginning to decrease. Well, this was very surprising to us, and it wasn't anything that we expected. But fortunately, we had been conducting basic research for no other purpose than to understand how these ecosystems operated. And we understood what the ramifications of this change was. What happens in these forests is trees suck up most of the carbon dioxide, but their growth rates suffer when they're inhabited by vines. And they also die a lot faster when they're inhabited by vines. So this change in these forests wasn't just some, some esoteric change that we thought would be interesting and we could write some papers for 10 other people around the world to read. <laughs> this actually is really, really important for the global carbon budget. So it turns out that we had stumbled upon this fundamentally interesting question, a question that we had no idea was even important. No one had thought to ask this because there was no reason to ask this. And this, was, this had a huge impact on my career, actually. And it caused me to, to begin to wonder about our strategy. What are we doing as scientists? Are we just going out there and testing these theories and seeing what we find? So, you know, I took a couple days off. I climbed some mountains. I thought about what we're going to do next and, and what our strategy would be. But I also thought, how do other research groups 
come up with big ideas? How do they find those discoveries that we're all searching for? Well, it turns out, when you look into the data, most of the big discoveries in science are completely accidental. For example, after two weeks of vacation, when Alexander Fleming came back to his lab, he realized one of his experiments was totally colonized by fungus. Well, a lesser scientist would have just thrown everything out and started over. But Fleming saw something interesting. He realized that some of the fungus was actually killing some of these pathogenic bacteria that he was working with. This accidental discovery changed modern medicine. It was the, the invention of penicillin saved millions and millions of lives. Prior to this invention, if you got a little scratch in an infection or some other disease, <laughs> it's very likely that you would die. There was no cure. The doctors would just watch and wait. Another accidental discovery was when Perry Spencer, who was working for Raytheon, he walked in front of one of the big machines that they were developing and realized that the chocolate bar in his pocket was starting to melt. Well, this machine wasn't for melting chocolate. It wasn't for cooking food, but this actually gave rise to the modern microwave oven. And although this wasn't quite as important as penicillin, it still may have saved the lives of thousands of college students around the world. <laughs> UK 9284. This was a drug that was being developed to alleviate chest pain, spasms in the coronary arteries. Well, the drug failed. It didn't work at all. But researchers noticed another very curious effect. Sales of this drug now exceed a billion dollars a year, which isn't bad for a failed drug. Even going back to the 18th century, you know, Benjamin Franklin started to explore electricity. You know, in the 18th century, they didn't have electricity in the homes. Electricity was used for magic tricks it basically, because it basically produced a pop and a spark. So it was great for magic. And, and Franklin started to look into how electricity worked and how it was related to lightning. Well, he would have never been able to imagine that electricity would become just a common part of everyday life. More recently, 1969, when the ARPANET had only four computers attached to it, no one could have guessed that this, what was essentially a basic research project, would have turned into the internet, which just permeated society. The final example I'm going to show you is this one. This is called the Keeling Curve. And anyone who works on global climate change or ecology recognizes this curve. And this was the first unequivocal evidence that carbon dioxide is rising in our atmosphere. But when Charles David Keeling started to investigate CO2 levels, he wasn't saying, oh, I'm going to show that CO2 is increasing. No, he just wanted to know, how does it change seasonally? How does the Earth breathe in terms of CO2? It goes in and out. As he collected more and more data, he realized, wow, there's something even more exciting here. And then, of course, you all know the rest of the story, right? And so this is the first real solid evidence of human-caused climate change. And this idea of accidental discovery is so common in science that the Nobel Prize winning scientist, Max Delbruck, came up with a principle to describe it. And what Delbruck called this was the principle of limited sloppiness. And what Delbruck was saying was one should be sloppy enough in science so that unexpected things can happen, but not so sloppy that we'll miss it when it does happen. So Delbruck's idea brings us to a larger question. And that question is, how do we make novel and transformational discoveries? Discoveries that change paradigms, that improve society, that improve the way we treat disease, that improve everyone's lives. Well, if we can formulate some sort of rules or some, some strategy to make true transformational discoveries, well, this is the holy grail of research. This is what everyone wants to do. So when I started to research this topic, I realized this isn't a novel question at all. <laughs> this goes back all the way to Plato. And this is known as Plato's paradox. Plato argued, well, first Plato asked, how do you search for something that you do not know? If you meet it, how will you know this is what you're searching for? Basically, Plato argued that true novelty is impossible to achieve. It's just too far outside of your current paradigm 
to understand the importance of it. It's beyond the limit of comprehension. But that can't be right. I mean, we've come a long way since the time of Plato. There's been thousands of truly novel innovation since then. So how do we reconcile this paradox? Well, Delbruck's principle provides a way around Plato's paradox. Delbruck understood that true no truly novel ideas were, were very difficult to, to, to conceive. But he also understood that if we ask basic research questions, sometimes those novel questions pop out, and they emerge. And if you're alert enough and lucky enough, You'll see them, and that may change everything. So basic research is a proven path to new discovery. Researchers in labs and forests, however you want to think of researchers, incrementally advance science. And it's an, it's, they do this through persistent study. Some lucky scholars have huge accidental breakthroughs, which change everything. With change, they, these breakthroughs change paradigms. They change our quality of life. They change our whole society. Delbruck's principle works because we don't know the next big idea. It could come from any area in biology, in chemistry, in art, in literature, anything that causes a shift in our current paradigms. So we can't search for it head on. So back to the important question. How do we make novel and transformational discoveries? Well, the answer is both simple and counterintuitive. We make these discoveries by not looking for them. We make them by looking for important, fundamental research questions that we know will incrementally advance our fields of study. And if we're alert enough and lucky enough, maybe we'll discover something truly novel. As for my lab, we believe this is true. We believe that we can hopefully make some important breakthroughs. And if not, we'll at least move our field forward so that we can tackle bigger problems. We believe that global environmental change is the biggest problem facing humankind. And so we will continue to study basic theory and ecology using large scale experimental tests in tropical forests, which is what we've been doing for years. And maybe if we're lucky and alert enough, we'll find something even bigger. For the larger academic community, I am convinced that through basic research, we will achieve breakthroughs that we could never have imagined before. And these breakthroughs will change society. Most research will incrementally increase our knowledge base. Some will fail completely, but a lucky few will achieve breakthroughs that will improve society improve our quality of life, and benefit all of mankind. Thank you.